Keeping it honest. You are fake news. Keeping it real. I want to smoke some pot. And keeping it libertarian. I'm a libertarian for life. These are the Fakertarians. My superpower is being honest. I'll eat your ass. I will. And this is the maiden voyage of the Fakertarians setting sail on the podcast ship. No bully podcasters. Sorry we're a little bit late, but you know in this world, nothing ever goes exactly as planned. So deal with it, plebs. And now, it's the fearless captain of this ship, John Hudak. Hey guys, and welcome to the first episode of the Fakertarians podcast. I'm John Hudak, along with Jeremy Kontorowicz and Brian Hagen. Uh, today we have for you um, Drew Breckis, comic Drew Breckis, you wanted me to introduce him as. Right. Um, <laughs> he's the, uh, he's a member of the Mises caucus and we've had some issues with them recently. So we wanted to bring him on to talk. How are you doing today, Drew? Uh, pretty good. Excited to have this conversation. Great. So, uh, what made you interested in the Mises caucus initially? Um, I guess I just saw them as trying to continue the Ron Paul movement in the libertarian party. And that interested me a lot. So that's, I joined. So to like our uh, our differences we've had, or not not specifically with you, but um, simple answer. Yeah. Does the do you think the Mises Caucus has an alt right problem? A little bit, yeah. I don't think it's as bad as where I like other groups that I've seen it uh, in um, places I talk about is like the anarcho capitalism subreddit. Uh, there's a big alt right, or at least there was a really big alt right problem on there. See yeah, I've, some I've alt- seen that there. Yeah, I see some alt writers in the Mises Caucus. Um, one of them, I think Jesse Miller, got kicked out. Uh, well, he got another one who is extremely edgy, who says he's really not alt right. You know, he's not alt right. Um, you know, got let back in. So, so on on Jesse Miller, um, that was the whole thing. That was the Europe is for Europeans guy who had the whole uh, saying that libertarians should do more about, uh, I think it was race as it relates to social cohesion, IQ, and criminality. Um, mm-hmm. He was actually the reason. I Just for anyone who knows, I was in the Mises Caucus for a while. I was in leadership for maybe a little over a year. Um, I resigned leadership in November. And then in late February... Um, in the private Mises caucus group, I was talking with some people. I brought up that that I thought there was an alt-right problem. And Michael Heiss, the chairman of the caucus, he took issue with that and he asked me to name one. And I named the guy uh, Drew was talking about, Jesse Miller. This guy had posted stuff about how Europe is for Europeans. He was talking, saying libertarians need to do more about race. Um, And I was hoping when I brought him up, like, okay, we'll, we'll kick this guy out. It seems pretty obvious to me that this is an alt right thing. But instead, um, Michael Heiss was arguing with me about it. He told me that I need to deal with Jesse and that Jesse just has a different cultural preference. So, so I left. Um, and we posted about it a few times later. And M- Michael doubled down on his issues with, I mean, he doubled down on his defense of Jesse. Um, until a few days later when we found some comments of Jesse ranting about Jews in a, in a private group that, that finally did it. And then the emo Hoppian guy, the other guy he was talking about, um, he's po- he posts some edgy stuff all the time. He's defending Molyneux. He's saying that the content, he's actually defending some of the content of the Ron Paul newsletters about like 95% of blacks doing something like being criminals or, or criminals or 95% black or something like that. Um, so they, they originally kicked him out and then they told them that if he toned down things, he could be allowed back in the caucus. So my issue there is that it kind of seems like it's more a public perception thing than them actually caring about, about what people think. So do you think, do you agree with that at all? And if not, or if yes, what do you think can be done to fix the problem? Yeah, I certainly think it's, Part of that of you know want to look good um, in public. I, I think another part of it is a lot of tribalism of oh these are our guys and Pinkertarians are coming after them, and the left is coming after them. So we need to try to protect our own. That's it's part of that sort of thing. Um, the Mises Caucus has a plank that says we will not talk about cultural issues. You know, I, but it seems that 
uh, they, they do talk about cultural, <laughs> cultural issues a, a lot. They just um, um, pretend that they don't. And I wrote a post about that in the Mises uh, caucus group and it wasn't approved um, because it was just, we're not allowed to talk about culture, but I don't know. I f feel like it's sort of a little, um, if not dishonest, just willfully ignorant. Oh, abs absolutely. Uh, yeah. But, so, um, you, what would I do about that? Yeah. Uh, um, continually critique these people. Um, have a high standard of what you can say. Like a lot of alt writers, they can't help themselves. So, you know, if someone's saying, "I want to throw all these people off of helicopters and I'm going to like kill all the socialists," and you know, they say like racist things, um, you know. I think that's a good, that would be a great starting point. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I wish I could see leadership do that, but I mean, it just, it hasn't exactly happened to this point. Um, another issue that I kind of realized, and Michael Heiss has denied that he knew about this, at least for Jesse Miller. I'm going to get to exactly what it was in a second, but both Miller and the other guy, Emo Hoppy, and that's what he's called on Twitter. So that's what we refer to him as. They claim to have both been donors to the caucus. And I know Michael's talked about wanting to be a full-time activist. Do you believe that that fact had anything to do with the reluctance to kick them? Um, I'm not following. Sorry. But, um, how does that? Well, the fact that they were both, they were both donors to the caucus or they both, I can't say cause I don't actually have their, were... their, their records, but they both claim to be donors to the caucus. Who were the large donors? I don't know. We're talking about ten bucks. I'm honestly not sure. I, I don't. I don't think the incentive is going to be that that high. To uh, um, that's the reason. I think this is way more about tribalism and never. Back, what, what's what do they always say? Never back down. Never apologize. Apologizing is weakness. Don't I don't do owe that. you an explanation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I I've noticed though that I I know there's there's some people in the caucus I still like a lot, like you. Um, but then there's others that I mean they're. I don't know if they're just ignoring her or if it's the tribalism, tribalism issue or whatever you said, but they're, they deny that there's even like any sort of issue. It's what you get when you don't so you don't talk about culture and then, you know, I mean, it's sort of surprising to me. Um, I don't know why this argument can't be used to let socialists into the caucus. I mean, after all social could just say, Oh, I'm not, I'm not all about just raising like utility to the maximum, like freeing the most number of dollars or raising, raising GDP the highest. I just think people will do better in um, communities where all private property, no, sorry, all the means of production are uh, communally owned. I think this will be better. I think people will be better for friendlier social capital increase. And that's why I'm socialist. And what, what could you say? That's not like a cultural position, but <laughs> I mean, so moving on to the, the next uh, issue, which was kind of tied into this one. Um, Dave Smith, I'd like to talk about him a little bit. Hey, Dave, if you're watching or any of Dave's, any of Dave's fans, I know they, they pop comic. into our page a lot. <laughs> comic, 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 Dave, Dave. Smith. <laughs> um, what do you think his impact on the Libertarian Party is and the Mises Caucus in general? Like, because I was worried a bit. And I, I, I can't say for sure that these people were coming in through Dave, but back when I was in leadership, I would say it was late 2019. A lot of these people coming in were coming in. It seemed like they were coming in through the big podcaster recruitment drive. And it also seemed like a lot of them would get really upset if you criticize Dave Smith. So that's always the problem of, you know, you follow someone, you start simping for them. <laughs> like there's like no way kind of around that. Like, I don't think that's Dave's fault, but, uh, I think what is Dave's fault is that um, he definitely is introducing a lot of people to alt-right ideas and not uh, giving them their proper critique. And he should be doing that. He does that for left-wing ideas. He should do that for uh, alt-right ideas. But he sort of just kind of, whenever I see him talk to this alt, any alt-righter, he kind of just like dumbly just agrees with them. I'll just say, yeah, you know what? Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. Or, or if he disagrees with them, he won't explain why I say, you know, I don't agree with you to that, but anyway, let's like moving on. So, that's, <laughs> yeah. That's I, I noticed in that, in that second episode, I don't know if you've seen it, the his second episode with Nick Fuentes, mm -hmm. 
He was he was defending uh, Nick Fuentes' Holocaust video about the, how you couldn't bake six million cookies or something along those lines, and he was he was saying like, "Oh, that's not so bad. That's funny. Like, I don't know why people care about that." So it, it's kind of the same thing you're thinking about. You're you've been you were talking about there, and Brian and Jeremy. I mean, feel free to chime in when you'd like, guys. Well, I always see the whole you know, saying something and then either coming back with, oh, it was just a joke, you know, when it turns out it's not very, you know, a popular opinion. Uh, I, what did it, what was it called? The Schroden, Schrodinger's douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, where, exactly. where it's, where it's not a, where it's, it's totally not a joke, you know, based on the, the reaction that's received afterwards. And yeah, I see, you know, especially with Dave and some of the stuff that I watch is, is, exactly that you know it's just it's just a joke if 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 somebody doesn't like it and that's how you know that's how it kind of almost seems cultish like um the the defense that ends up getting built around it's just a joke very cultish i think a lot of it is extremely cultish i want to go back to something that drew said a little while ago about you know the the no discussing culture that's something I see a lot. And I'll say this, it, it's primarily from the right. I don't see it as much from the left as an argumentative tactic, but I do see that all the time where they'll be like, well, you know, uh, they, they use, they, it's, it's a, a sort of plausible deniability, I guess. They throw something that you would say is definitely about their own culture, okay? But if you talk about something that you like, all of a sudden they shut it down by saying, we're not going to have that sort of discussion with you. We don't wanna talk about identity politics. We don't wanna talk about culture. And then it just leaves the conversation at an absolute standstill. So I certainly don't think it's just within the caucus. I think it's really a general mindset that floats around out there in various aspects of libertarianism. And it's problem, it's a problem. So yeah. oh, go ahead. I was going to say, moving on to the next, uh, next thing I wanted to bring up. I was just, who do you support for libertarian party chair? I was just, I, I can, I can kind of guess, but I was just, I was just a little curious about it. I, I still, I still <laughs> like Josh. Um, you know, Josh can post something that, you know, is from like conspiracy theory thing and it's totally unvetted. And, you know, he can add hofter say, well, I found like this study that like after the fact, like kind of like, you know, it was, it was pulled, but like ignore that, you know, he can do that. The, the fact of the matter is that the libertarian chairman, if he posts something like that is not, it's not going to be a big deal. We had the most mundane libertarian like party presidential candidate possible. His only hobbies were climbing mountains and smoking weed. And he made one brain fart on Aleppo and the media just ran with it. So th there's no way that a libertarian party um, chairman or can candidate, if they're really going to get attention from the media, there's no way that there's not going to be any baggage whatsoever. Besides that, I just, I just like Josh's, um, I just like the, the caucus's message of, this is, I think Josh is open. Joshua Smith is open borders, mm -hmm. by the way. I like, I like oh, yeah. that a lot. Mm -hmm. He's radical libertarian. Um, so I think people try to bring up these bad things about him. I just don't think they matter, <laughs> matter that much. Are you satisfied with how he's handled the response to the alt-right problem or, or any of those controversies? A, a lot of it was, that was where the whole, uh, we don't owe you an explanation. Oh, wait, I turned my green screen off one second. Let me fix that real quick. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I don't owe you an explanation. <laughs> um, it, it, it sounds like he doesn't have the largest amount of control about the Facebook group. Um, I mean, he obviously has pull with people. He has people's ears, but I wouldn't. I, I don't think you can put a lot of that on him. Unfortunately, uh, not, un not unfortunately, but no, I get what you mean. Yeah. So what are your feelings on Hans Hermann Hoppe? Do you feel that his associations with prominent white nationalists like Jared Taylor and Chase Rachels are harm harmful to the Liberty movement or to the caucus in any way, given that there's so many, I mean, I wouldn't say at, like, it's not that everyone's a Hoppian in the Mises caucus, like not even close, but I mean, there's a decent amount of them in there. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it's 
it's really bad. <laughs> I think it's really <laughs> bad for the movement because you're just introducing people to alt-right ideas, not critiquing them. And we never see alt-righters going libertarian. We always see someone who gets really into Hoppe's Property and Freedom Society, who watches Jared Taylor's speech at the Property and Freedom Society, who watches Richard Lynn at the Property and Freedom Society. They go to the alt-right and then you know, they start asking questions about, well, why can't we use like aggression to um, keep um, races out and certain races out and stuff like that. And I think that's really bad. <laughs> the, the put, well, there's, the put it lightly. there's been such a fetishization, I think, over the years of the right to discriminate. And I think that's what so much of that ilk does. They they love that so much. They then slide down that pipeline when they go to uh, you know some of those lectures that he has hosted over the years, and it's it's just an awful thing. I think. Yeah. Um, I just have I just have a lot of uh, pro problems with Hava like on the. Not not even just on the alt right, just uh, like argumentation ethics and his border on borders. Um, in gotcha. general. Well, and you know, and when it comes to some of Hoppe's stuff, um, I, you know, it's it's not even as terrible as like his followers turn it right. into. Like you know, yeah, I you know, I get the Covenant community HOA thing. Um, I don't dare ask them about you know how you transfer that to another generation considering generational contracts are pretty silly but um you know how do you bind somebody who didn't sign something into into that but i've never never really asked it because i've never really wanted to open that can of worms but the just the entire concept of um not concept but what people turn it into and how it's argued and it's always a moving goalpost too when they when they try to you know when you try to talk with somebody you know you bring up a point and they just move the goalpost down further and further and further and further um and then you get nowhere with them and you know just it's it's this meant almost this mental gymnastics of well i just don't want to admit that i'm a racist and don't want to live next to you know uh, i don't want to live next to a black person and and it's almost like this constant defense of not wanting to admit it but they pretty much do when right. when you try to when you try to question you know any anything about what's what they believe and that's not even i i don't think that's even you know hoppa's position um you know or necessarily belief um so i kind of wonder <laughs> you know i kind of wonder almost if you know he is somewhat embarrassed of some of his um you know followers and kind of what they've turned his writings into I, 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 that's, I, that's a good point i've wondered that myself I'm, I'm sorry let me just take this for one second because what they've done is they've taken that one paragraph and they've turned it into this like racist fan fiction and they've based their entire like cult of personality around that mm -hmm. going with what you're saying jeremy and then you can't have a good faith argument because god knows they don't want any sort of criticism of of their god that failed <laughs> You're having too much fun with that. Oh yeah, I learned about the green screen. Green screen today. Yeah, that was that was fun. As we were sitting around here, Drew, before uh, because of course this is our maiden voyage. So I would like to thank you for being the one to go out here on these rough seas with us and take this little journey. But mm. before we went in here, we were all sitting around trying to figure things out, and John really liked that green screen a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I've got my I've got a blue T-shirt right here, and just sure. <laughs> yeah. um, Hoppe, I was gonna say that I, I think it's pretty clear that he is, um, you know, like a hardcore race realist. I mean, he has Richard Lynn there to give biological um, explanations for Jewish IQ. I mean, if you just look at any Richard Lynn's work, um, you know, he's talking about um, he believes that. I think the heritability of IQ between races is 80%, which means he thinks that the differences between racial groups and IQ is 80% genetic. That's what that comes down to. So I think it's pretty clear that Hoppe knows the people who he, who he associates with is. Yeah, yeah. And 
just with the closed borders people in general, I, a lot of them will say that we're we're not racist. Okay. And I think a lot of them like do try to they don't have like those stereotypical, you know, other racist beliefs. I don't know if I'd call them racist, but if you when you get down to it, when you like ask them, where do you want to limit immigration? Okay, it's always okay, South South America, it's always Mexico. It's never we have too many Norwegians coming to America. We have too many um, Japanese people coming to America. It's always or the Irish. Yeah, or <laughs> Irish, too many Irish coming to America. Irish welcome, but, but not encouraged. <laughs> That's a very good point. I've I've, I've long thought that it, it always tends to, and and I don't. It's just a fact. If the skin is brown, shut them down. That's kind of what they go with. They, you're right. There's never any discussion about not allowing you know some English guy come over here. Stefan can come in from Canada anytime he wants, as far as they're concerned, and move here. You know, right. even but, even, yeah. if, even if Canada was never asked, <laughs> right? Exactly. <laughs> we were never asked. <laughs> it's it's just such a problem, and all these names have just become punchlines over the past four or five years or so. I remember really liking Stefan. I even remember dabbling in, you know, some Hoppa stuff years ago, and it's just. I, even like with Hoppa, for any good he's done, the fanboys, kind of like Jesus, the fanboys have turned everybody else off. <laughs> right. I same same here. I mean, I I I started watching stuff on videos. I started watching and reading, not watching, but reading Hoppa stuff. Um, I started listening to Tom Woods. Uh, <laughs> Me too. You know, Chris Chris Cantwell. Um, you know, I, I started with with a lot of that stuff. Um, it's just such a such a different landscape than it even was what five, six, seven years ago. Drew, I'm curious what what keeps you in the LPMC? What do you like about it? What what words do you have to offer to those of us who have never spent any time in there? But of course, we hear all the awful which is a fact, but wh why do you think it's worth saving? Do you think it can be salvaged at this point? Yeah, of, of course. I, first of all, I don't think it's overrun with alt writers. Like okay. I, I mentioned the anarcho capitalist capitalism subreddit. Like that was yeah. overrun with yeah, bad. You would, you would just get downvoted to hell. If you try to like make anything criti critiquing some alt writer, they would just group downvote you and like, I mean, it was kind of pathetic, but uh, in the Mises caucus, there's nothing, it's nothing like that. I mean, mm -hmm. you have people, I mean, they, they all love Dave Smith, but almost all of them don't love Dave Smith because they like, came from the old right. I mean, this is more of like people are leaving, not like coming into. Uh, so I guess I disagree with John that I think that Dave Smith is like the main problem of the LPMC old right problem. I just think that he needs to use his platform more ethically. Um, uh, why should we save the Mises Caucus? Um, because we need to get the energy from the Ron Paul movement back because libertarianism is kind of like dead in the water right now. I mean, I mean, really, there's not that many interesting voices online that I that I see. Uh, you know, I, I like listening to um, some reason podcasts. I like listening to Tom Woods. But I mean, like who who else is there? I mean, I don't I don't see anyone on YouTube. I don't see anyone. Um, you know, you have some people on Twitter, I guess, but I mean, how much is that helping really? I mean, just have people who are already libertarians mass liking some, you know, roads are like, we, f we figured out the road road problem. We figured out the solution, you know, roads. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the road. Probably the best part of the Mises caucus is its commitment to um, nullification because probably one of the best ways that we can, nullify or, or get rid of federal um, federal laws is just to nullify them. So they aren't huge on immigration, but, you know, we have sanctuary cities. Philadelphia is a sanctu sanctu sanctuary city. Uh, that's a good thing. We should have basically the same thing for gun control. We should say we will not enforce this gun, this gun control. Um, and you can do that for drugs. You can do that. I mean, I mean obviously, there's decriminalization. Um, uh, State and local levels, local levels, I don't know. but uh, 
Um, so that's what I think are the best parts of the Mises Caucus. And I really just think that we need to get back this like Ron Paul movements um, energy. And I don't see the Pragmatist Caucus doing it. I don't see the Radical Caucus doing it. I don't see anyone else doing it, unfortunately. Well, that's a really good answer. And I think that I, I can tell, Drew, and I, I know from my engagements with you over the past year or so, uh, you seem very sincere in your your views. I certainly wouldn't call you a fakertarian by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> and that's good. I, I mean, it gives me a little bit of hope that there's still good Black people out there. And, no fakertarians here. <laughs> that's good. That's very good. Not not like old emo hoppian. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, th there's a good example, though, of why, like, as an outsider, I sit there and I look at the caucus and have to say, and, and that's really the fact, Drew. Again, you know, I've never been involved with that caucus. I do know some people in there. They are fine folks. They're people I've known for a number of years. But you you do see so much of, like, the emo hoppians who then, you know, they tell him, tone down your edge. Then they let him back in, and he's back out there posting more edgy stuff as we speak not quite to the level it was thank goodness and he seems like a nice enough kid i'll be honest with you but it's like you don't have to promote race realism on your twitter dude like stop that and and i guess that's my point the caucus needs to say look we'll allow you back in but you're going to have to go completely straight and i know some out there but tyranny and and freedom of speech and you know thought policing no you're a representative for that caucus don't be posting freaking race realism stats all over your twitter page and saying based after it <laughs> based reminds me of that Volnaft guy he hangs out with that uh that mm -hmm. little that 17 year old kid who like who likes the unabomber and uh all his other stuff he actually he and some other people just started a site yesterday called hoppian.org and it, it's it's just like a it's exactly what you'd expect it's like they're complaining about the Walberts and stuff like that like i feel like it's just gonna be like radical capitalist for kids like chase rachel's yeah. <laughs> the old thing <laughs> i mean they're Walberts too they can, they can try and deny it but you know i mean they're just pointing the finger at their own people <laughs> well, they were actually talking about, and, and I've actually found this very encouraging. They were talking about in one of the articles posted there about no longer using the libertarian name and taking on some other title. And I'm like, yes, please <laughs> do right. that because they're saying the libertarian name can't be salvaged. No, dudes. That's what we're saying about you. You're the ones who have taken that name and made it into something just awful. So yeah, take your new name. Call yourself Hoppy Frogs. Call yourself Hoppy <laughs> Jerk Off. I don't give a fuck. Just do whatever you want to do. Just don't call yourself a libertarian. I, we and might stop have promoting to... bad ideas to 17-year-olds. <laughs> we Come might on. have to do the, do the Hoppy Frog thing. I, I kind of like that. They get mad Hoppy when I call them the frog people. I like, I like the frog, I'll be honest. I think the frog is a good name. It really is, isn't it? Hippity hoppity, get the fuck off my property. <laughs> That's perfect. The only time I really like the old Hoa thing is when it means keeping those ass hats out. <laughs> um, do we want to talk about anyone else? Like a Molomim or uh, yeah, we can talk about we can talk about Molomim, especially because the whole Dave Smith controversy. Yeah. When I was on Dave Smith's show, it came out it came out of that because I mean yeah. it wasn't just I know it was the great thing, but it I mean it was it was about more than that. It's this guy who used to be an ANCAP, even though he had some weird things going on even even in the past. But I mean he. He, see, he seems to have like totally sold out. He's uh, he he he's always spoken against white nationalism, but now he's an empiricist. That time he went to Sweden, Molyneux, I mean, and like just I, I just Poland. Didn't, like, he went to Poland and, and he, oh, yeah, tried, yeah. he was, tried there. He was so it was, he was, just it was so Poland. happy. He's an he's an empiricist. And we were never asked, <laughs> but um, I, I just didn't like that he was being shown up to be like some great libertarian now because I, I just think the guy is like terrible yeah he so, I, mean, I've, I mean going back to like the like you know he had some past issues i mean let's just call it what it was like he had a cult 
Yeah. Like they did a literal cult where he told people if you were ever spanked, like you need to, like people don't believe me when I say this. He has old podcasts you can go find on um FDR um that say like the, the title of the podcast is But My Parents Were Nice to Me. So, so someone will try yep. to say, But Molyneux, my parents were nice to me. Like like I, I don't want to defoo them, and then he'd explain to you, "Oh, that's just that's that's such you know like the whole cult like yeah yeah that's so naive of you to believe that." <laughs> Did they? Yeah, your parents the manipulated school? you. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, he was very, he was very big. Uh, he was an anti theist in the back in the past, and so, mm -hmm. suddenly he jumped. He he keeps on jumping his views according to popularity. It seems like to me. So before he was an anti theist. Back in you know during the uh, I don't know heydays of the atheist movements, you know like what was it when Christopher Hitchens was still alive? So he was this ultra anti theist back then. Now he says, that. "Well, religion you know can have these good good effects, and you know you shouldn't defoo your parents anymore uh, if they're yeah. if they're religious." Um, so there there was that. Uh, oh, he's like, made that change. He said, "Don't defoo if they're religious." I didn't know that. I don't. I think he doesn't talk about it anymore. I think he might have said. Mm. He, I think he said he changed his mind when he went onto Tom Woods' podcast most recently. But also, he never like called up all the people. I don't. I don't think there's any evidence he called up all the people who actually defooed their parents. Said, "I'm sorry for telling you to like abandon your family <laughs> because they took you to right. Sunday school." <laughs> you know that's it's interesting that you know if he if he's gone from such an anti-theist to you know where he is now and um i guess you know do do you know people like like Mol molyneux actually believe everything or are they just excellent at at marketing and making sure that they're playing to a base that'll give him money at the time you know what 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 could he be looking like in 10 years you know depending on how how things you know and how things move um random thought but no, I could, could it could it be could it be marketing or is it is it could be a genuine change in thought um who i guess time will time would be able to tell that but i think he genuinely changes his thought it's just that the reason he changes his thoughts are like extremely bad reasons. Like go where the money goes, go where like the popularity seems to take you. And so that, I mean, I'm saying he's a really good liar because he can convince himself his own, like his own bullshit. Yeah. I mean, it, it seemed like the change happened right when Donald Trump was kind of rising and right when the yeah. alt-right was getting popular. Like he was, I remember Molyneux cause I, I used to listen to him sometimes. I didn't really know much about the whole cult thing. Like those were like things I would skip kind of thing. And looking back at it, I'm like, oh my God, I'm glad I didn't get involved in that. Me but too. he just looks like he he's kind of changed his views right right when that happened. Uh, I think it all started, I don't know what happened first, Trayvon Martin or Eric Garner. Um, I, you know, I, th I think I might've agreed with, um, if, I've, at the time, at least, if I'm, so I could revisit the facts, maybe I changed my mind on Trayvon Martin. But with Eric Garner, it was just ridiculous. So, do you guys know the facts of the case? Like, yeah. the police just choked out this guy who was selling Lucy's, who was selling um, cigarettes without New York state uh, taxes on it or city taxes on it. I don't know which, but whatever. It's not important. And um, he was like choked out by this police officer, he died. And then Molyneux went into this big thing of saying he had asthma, therefore, like, he died of the asthma. He didn't die from being choked. Um, uh, John, you, you're, you're doing law school, right? You know, like, the, what's it called? E Eggshell skull, like, theory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're still responsible for, if, yeah. if he has asthma, I mean, you kill him, like, you still, you're still responsible for it. Unless you're a police officer. And you're like, <laughs> right. <laughs> then it's just doing your duty. Right. Yeah. I mean, serving and protecting while strangling people for selling Lucy's right. and then wearing t-shirts that say, I can breathe when yeah, you're okay. at a, at yeah. a memorial for your own selves as the NYPD did after his final words were, I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think what did they just, they just fired the, the officer that did it. What's five years later. Wow. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, they fired yeah. him a few months back. Finally, and there was a whole outcry over it from yeah, thin blue line people. Yeah, they are. If you ever are bored, scroll through the um, scroll through either of the police New York Police Union's pages. It is, yeah. um, it's special. <laughs> <laughs> it's like boomer to the max, like stereotypical boomer crying to the max. It's great. <laughs> So, Drew, who are you supporting for the LP presidential nomination? Because I know the Mises caucus is mostly behind Hornberger. I've heard of some people change into Amash. I mean, there's so many new people joining right now. So I, would, I was just curious to see where you're at. Uh, I think Hornberger is better on the issues. Um, specifically, Hornberger is pro-life, but he's not as a radical pro-lifer as um, Amash is. Amash is saying, like... Like abortion should just be outright like uh, sounds like a federal ban after like three days. Yeah, I heard I heard the three uh, days thing. There's yeah. that interview that was dug up, and I I had no idea he was like that bad about it. Like yeah. that was yeah. Like how do you even? I don't know. That's yeah. that's so, like draconian right there. Yeah, so I'm asking Sam Coppinger if you know if if someone can. W w what is his theory? If like you're just you don't have to have the perfect answer, but if you're in the right direction, oh, yeah, yeah. you that's, can ignore it. Right He's just in the complete opposite direction and how, so how can you support him? <laughs> um, Actually, the was, other thing was uh, on uh, borders, Jacob Hornberger is like way better than Amash. Um, but there, there are, you know, considerations of, you know, you want to have someone who you expect the general population to vote for you want to have someone who can get the votes. I mean, even Murray Rothbard said that. Um, I'm trying to f remember when, like, some, I, th I think it's on YouTube. I think it's the one big Q&A thing he has on YouTube for some um, state convention that he did a long time ago. But um, so I think those are all valid considerations when choosing between the two. Um, I like both of them. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of Vermin Supreme. I don't think making our party the meme party is really going to work. <laughs> I, I met Vermin Supreme. He's a great person. I have a lot of respect for him, but uh, I I just don't see it ever like working out. And like it just sounds like the uh, Lib Sox and the and the uh, party just kind of want to party like crash and burn, or just denying that that would happen. If, if he, uh, well, I, it puts me. It puts me into that situation, Drew, where it's kind of like my whole mindset on things. Anarchy is always my goal, but then I look around at the people in Walmart right now during this <laughs> pandemic, and I realize it can't exactly be anarchy yet. So yeah, like Vermin, that's my man, but I don't think we're quite ready for that in the electorate to make that decision. So and like you said, he's a great guy and he's got some great ideas. He's backed by some fantastic people. I love Spike. I love all of them. But at the same time, yeah, I just don't right. think that's going to be the vote that ultimately brings out grandma and grandpa. Right. As much as I'd love to see like Trump and Vermin and Biden on the debate stage and, you know, only the guy with the boot on his head can, you know, form a complete sentence. Um, <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah. Definitely not quite, not quite time yet. And, and that's the sad reality of it too. Like you said, the only person that can form a complete sentence is the guy with a boot on his head. And that's, isn't that just a sad commentary on the state of today's <laughs> politics in America anyway? <laughs> Good Lord. Well, who wouldn't want to vote for two senile old rapists? So. <laughs> right. Two senile old, very burnable at the swimming pool, old racists. Oh, I, I said rapists, but maybe. Oh, that's, that's, that's what I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm <laughs> I mean, We're just kind of splitting the difference there. We'll <laughs> one of the R words will work. <laughs> really, found, any of them. I found it kind of interesting that the Mises Caucus. I mean, I'll, there's in terms. I wouldn't. They're not all borderitarians. A lot of people are open borders in the caucus, but. In terms of like percentage wise, I would say they probably have the highest amount of Bordertarians of, of a caucus. But I found it kind of interesting that Hornberger is a huge open borders guy and he's the candidate there. But then on the Prague side, where you have a lot more open borders people, Amash, I mean, I didn't know he said that like, like I, I went back and looked at the quote about him saying he was 
good, like pretty much good with a border wall as long as the yeah. environmental yeah. concerns and private property concerns were taken up. And I was kind of surprised by that. Yeah, um, I don't know how true that is. Last time I think there was a poll in the Mises Caucus, it was like majority open borders, if I remember. Uh, um, Pragmatist Caucus, I mean, I the I don't know over the country, but in Louisiana, the Prags I knew were for borders. Um, and then the radical, uh, oh yeah, I should, should mention, I went to a college in uh, um, New Orleans in Louisiana, uh, at Loyola with Walter Block, so that was a lot of fun. Oh, nice. But yeah, um, uh, so maybe it's different from my experience there. But uh, and, and, you know, we and me and Walter's uh, students were all like huge open border supporters, and, and as he is. Um, oh yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't think it's this. Uh, I, I don't think it's as obvious as as John is saying. I think we have to do another poll. Or something i'd be interested in seeing a poll yeah. yeah i mean i'm I'm just basing it anecdotally because i know they yeah. there's been talk from heist so wanting to get rid of the borders plank and the uh in the lp platform and the abortion plank mm -hmm. um I, I just noticed that they seem to be accepting of bordertarians in there i'm not saying I, again i'm not saying like even a majority of them are they're not but i'm saying i i, I kind of was turned off a bit when i was in there about that oh yeah it's just a cultural preference yeah, exactly. <laughs> Go ahead, Drew. No, no, that's that, that's exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> Great minds. Great minds. Yeah, and that's it, dismissing it as that is just asinine, disingenuous, and just outright wrong. So he needs to take a better leadership role. I mean, he, I think he supports it. private borders. He says he supports private borders. It's kind of iffy what that means. Yeah. I, th I think all the closed borders people are trying to switch it to, oh, no, we support privatized borders. Okay, well, when we talk about open borders, we mean, like, the government borders. We're not saying that you should open your door, like, to everyone. It's not, like, like what it means. I, like, obviously, it's not what it means. Except to Maj Yes, yes. <laughs> right the the whole the whole comparing a country to a to a house is just it's it's ridiculous on its face but they everyone seems to cling to it so hard despite how easy it is to really you know kind of break that apart i mean you just you don't own the whole country um you know you know you can kind of quit back at them and it's like well if you believe in the collective ownership of you know of something then well you're just being a communist and that usually shuts them up but oh, yeah. yeah the just the the comparison to a a house is just so funny on its face but so many people seem to cling to it it's really interesting that so many people who go on and on about how the government if the government does anything it's socialism to then say government ownership of land we should have like mass like government ownership of land over the entire country where they can throw you out if you don't have citizenship and you didn't get it the right way and right you know, the right. government well it's it boils down to the you know the government shouldn't do anything unless it's the thing i like yep and, and why but you know and then that begs the question well why do you like the idea of the government throwing somebody out and hmm. yeah usually you don't get an answer on that one but and, and not the irish <laughs> Again, <laughs> not the Irish, the except Irish, the Irish. Damn Irish. I, I like the to Irish say, are fine. Yeah. I like to say, I don't think um, Bordertarians are disingenuous. I think they're very clearly wrong. I think that the idea is very clearly ad hoc. Like all their ideas for trying to justify like border walls are all done like ad hoc rationalizations, it seems, seems to me. But I think they, I think they really buy into it, you know? Mm -hmm. Sort of this idea of you know reason is about how like you can justify your own ideas. It isn't about finding the best like objectively right uh, solution to any question or problem. So mm -hmm. I think that everyone should uh, be concerned about that and always self reflect on their own positions because they can always fall into that. That's so, a really good point, actually. Oh, thanks. So in, in terms of the caucus, uh, the Mises caucus, obviously, I've, we talked about the Prags a little bit too. Do you think things are going to get better or things are going to get worse in terms of the the problems I've had with them, the 
the alt right kind of stuff? Like, do you think do you think it's gen or or are things going to stay the same? I mean, do you think it's generally going to stay like a, a small percentage of them? Do you think they're going to kind of grow? Do you think the alt writers are going to get fed up and just leave eventually? Um, I th I think removing Jesse Miller is like a, is a much bigger thing than you think it is, and they let emo hopping back in. I, I've gone over a lot of his tweets. A lot of them are really edgy, like um, not, not just jokes. He obviously believe like believes in like some alt-right beliefs, but mm -hmm. it, it seems like to me that he, like the people who are in that caucus who are alt-right are not like the radical, most radical, like white nationalists that you can find on um, like the, what, what was the subreddit? The, the Trump Reddit. Not uh, the, the Donald. Yeah. The Donald, not the most radical you can find there. Um, so what do I think is going to happen in the future? I, I, I really just don't know. Um, it, it depends on a whole host of issues about what Dave Smith does, what other people do. Um, if, you know, if they just keep on promoting alt right people, I think eventually you're going to see people start coming in who are alt right just, just for recruitment, like, because like alt writers, they'll try to recruit libertarians a lot because, um, unfortunately, it seems that a lot of them are susceptible because they think their enemy is the left and they're so obsessed with the and their the left being their enemy that they get all swept up in this belief of, oh, the cultural Marxists are opening the border, destroy Western civilization, and oh, but who who are the cultural Marxists? Oh, it's the Jews. Oh and, yeah, the triple parentheses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. I actually right. saw uh, Molyneux. He was he was kind of hinting at the because he does the little things where he likes to pander to the white nationalists instead of to, like coming out and saying it. Yep. Um, today it popped up in my in the Fakertarians Twitter feed. There was the stuff about like Harvard University and their associations with Jeffrey Epstein or whatever, and he just wrote, "Who runs Harvard?" And then his comments just go like, it's the Jews, it's the Jews. Yeah. It's, it's just little things like that. Like he likes to throw them bones like that. And it's like, oh, I'm just asking questions. Well, that's ultimately what got me blocked from his Twitter was because I kept saying, come on, Stefan, just say it. You know, you want to say it. Come on, just say it. And I just had this series of tweets. Just say Jews. That's what you want to say. Because all of his commenters are there. And after I said that, his commenters are going, he's right. <laughs> yeah, it is the Jews. And I'm going, I'm taking him to task for the other reason, and you're making, yep, that's good. It's the Jews that run it all. Yeah, no, his, <laughs> his, audience, <laughs> his audience is very alt right. Um, I don't know if you guys know about the article that David Gordon did on uh, Mall News book, uh, Universally Preferable Behavior, a while ago. You know, do you guys know David Gordon? You know, the Mises Institute? Yeah, I was, I, I yeah. read it a long time ago. I haven't, I'm not, I don't totally remember the contents, but I think he yeah. tore them apart from what I remember. Yeah, he, he did. Uh, I think this was like eight years ago. Well, anyway, like sometime in the last year, Mall News made a video ab about it again because he was so upset, upset about it. He had this original thing on his old on FDR forums his reply, but then he deleted all of his forums. So he had a, he just had to make a video about this again, like eight years later. Um, and if you just look at the comments of, of that, every single one of the people aren't even talking about like UPB or like David, David Gordon or anything. They're just talking about why don't you talk to this other alt writer, JF Gary FP about like the Jews. Why won't you do this Molina? You're being dishonest. You need to like talk about the Jews. <laughs> I'll try and post it in the chat. But. See, and that's, well, and that's kind of a, a feature of, you know, kind of this modern right, right wing or alt right movement is kind of the, the decentralization, the, the thought leaders are, um, they don't necessarily say it, you know, that's why, you know, you hear a lot of the, the crypto, you know, something, um, you know, um, you know, crypto fascist, that's the word, um, you know, that that's, you got this decentralization going on where, you know, some, some thought leader might present something, but leave it to um, everybody else to interpret it themselves. Um, and so then it becomes more plausible that deniability. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. I was going somewhere, but. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. You know, one, one thing I'll throw in, it was, gosh, I don't know, five, six, seven, 25 years ago, however long ago it was, who even knows what day it is anymore. But I used to do a podcast with a guy by the name of Corey Moore, 
and uh, we were over there on the LRN network and everything. That was when I was really thick, like with the whole free state project and all of that. Mm -hmm. And we started taking Molyneux to task. I believe it was around that time when he filed the DMCA takedown, yeah, that whole controversy. Yep. Yeah. So we were, we were discussing that. And then we started getting into the cult like nature of Molyneux and we're going, man, there's just something out right here. One guy in particular stands out in my mind. He was a Facebook friend of mine. He liked a lot of my work. I was pretty active with work at that time. And all of a sudden, he just sends me a message and says, how dare you? If you're going to say these things about Molyneux, I want nothing to do with you. You're not a libertarian. Ends up blocking all of us. And we talked about it later and said, wow, it must be a cult. <laughs> only, the only reaction like that stems from cult-like thinking. And... And like I said, that was a while back, like six, seven years ago. So it started becoming clear just what an, and I also have, uh, I have a black friend, therefore I can't be racist. No, I, I do have a, a black friend and he had met Molyneux at pork fest some years ago. And he said, Molyneux would not shake his hand, would not shake his hand. And that would have been like 2012 maybe. So I think he's held wow. a lot of these beliefs, but again, going back to what we were talking about the money he couldn't be outright then I mean, he's still not outright now but he couldn't even allude to it as strongly then as he does now but i think he holds to those beliefs and that's just the sort of person that he is one of my uh favorite youtubers uh like the author i'll put it i'll put his uh channel in the comments too um cool uh, he he always goes to port well he goes to port fest as much as he can and uh you know he says that it's just fairly obvious I don't know if he was at the Port Fest with Molyneux, but from people he talked to, it was just fairly obvious that Molyneux is a attention whore. Yep. And he wants to be the center of attention. He wants to be, you know, the guy at these places, but he'll never be like a David Friedman. He'll never be like what Jeffrey Tucker is there. And he's he's never just gonna be like the most like popular libertarian there. And a bunch of people are always gonna criticize him um so it just he just can't handle it and so he has to well, like, follow whatever pop where the popularity takes him and another problem with him that a lot of libertarians have and i've always said this for years is he doesn't have much humor especially about himself he had volunteered to be the subject of the pork fest roast back in i think it was 2011 or 2012 i wasn't there that year um but everyone that I knew that told me their eyewitness accounts were, he did not like the jokes. He thought they were just way too mean against him. So he was a little baby about it. It's a roast, Stefan. <laughs> what do you think is going to happen? Not everyone here is going to praise you and defu and th throw you money, dude. That's not how it works. It's a roast. So, yeah, I think that's part of it, too. I, I think his lack of humor and lack of, well, self, he, he did. Wow. Self-reflection, dude. You need it. Without that, he just ends up in the alt-right camp where he is now. Yeah. You want to talk about Christopher Chase Rachels for a little bit or anywhere else? Oh, yeah, we can talk about him because I was actually I meant to draw him to Hoppe because there was that whole thing um, where Chase Rachels, he's he was kind of like a run of the mill ANCAP for a while. He had that one book. I never read it, but people said it was basically just kind of like a re a rephrasing the of the cliff Roth notes of yeah of Hoppe. Rothbard and Hoppe. Um, a so spontaneous then, order. <laughs> that one. <laughs> That's it. So then in uh, was it 2017 or so he starts Rachel starts a site called Radical Capitalist and. Um, it, one of the first articles is calling black people proto humans. So you knew, you kind of knew what it was going to be at that point. He was already going down that road. I think he actually edited the article later to take that part out because everyone was like, what are you doing? Um, and then maybe a month later, he had an article about like the benefits of white nationalism and how it helps libertarian. There we go. There's the little avatar if anyone's looking on the screen. <laughs> um, but he was working on a book called White, White, and Libertarian. And he got Hoppe to agree to write the forward for him. So Hoppe was he, he they were emailing back and forth. There, Hoppe was like, Oh yeah, I love your I love your work. Um, I'd be happy to write the forward for you. So he writes it. I mean, he knows the title. He supposedly sent a copy of the manuscript and all that. 
Um, and then the, I, th I think what happened next was the original cover was supposed to be four people being hung from a helicopter. And one of them, I, f I forget exactly what they were supposed to be, but one of them was supposed to represent like Islam and was supposed to represent feminism. And there were two other ones that I'm not remembering exactly. I, I'm so bringing it, I'm bringing it up right now, actually. Yeah, I got it. I, I also got it up here. <laughs> yeah. Communism, nationalism, Antifa, and uh, feminism. Okay. So then Hoppe pulled back then and said he didn't want to be included in it anymore. Probably from um, donor pressure from the Mises Institute. Yeah, that's that's here. what it looked like because there was a lot of – I know – I mean, I know Chase Rachels isn't going to be the most like trustworthy guy, but he posted a lot of emails and messages with Mises Institute people that kind of making mm -hmm. it look like H Hoppe was okay with it at first. And then they were like, no, dude, don't do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, it, yeah. yeah. And he said he'd change. Rachel said he changed the cover. Um, and then, Oh yeah. There's, there's the cover for everybody. If, if anyone's looking on the stream, Rachel said he changed the cover and Hoppe's like, no, I still want nothing to do with this. So, uh, Rachel's and it ended up publishing the forward anyway, but even after this whole thing with the cover and saying he didn't want to do it, uh, Hoppe posted a, basically a modified version of that forward to lourockwell.com. And I mean, it still had praise for Chase, for, uh, I can't even say his name right now, for Chase Rachels in it. It was just, it was saying like, Chase Rachels' wonderful site, Radical Capitalist or something like that. And then it was also mentioning, I think it was Molyneux. I think there was like Bionic Mosquito, some people like that. So I mean- I don't know with Bionic, by, by the way. I just want to make that, unless you guys do, I haven't like seen anything from Bionic Mosquito. Oh, I don't- I don't know. I was I was just naming some names. Oh, okay. I just you just you know when you say and he praised Hitler. Oh and, yeah, okay. You know, and he, I don't know enough. Praised. I don't even I I don't even know about the guy. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what was I gonna say? Sorry, it, it didn't seem like he actually really had much of a problem with Rachel's. If he's still like name dropping him is a a good part of libertarianism. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I think the theory is that there was donor pressure from. Uh, the Mises Institute, who told Hoppe to not um, to to not uh, allow his forward in it, and then uh, he pulled it, and then Rachel's uh, published it anyway with Hoppe, Hoppe's forward, and so they had a falling out because of that. Uh, yeah, wait, not so bright, not employed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I, 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 he, is, he was always. Chase Rachel's, if you just go get into him a little more, uh, well, I mean, a, a, an ex of his posted this whole thing about, like, Ra Rachel's beliefs, like, even back when he was doing, like, what was it, like, the Blue Blue Ridge? Blue Ridge um, Liberty Project or something like that. I think it was yeah, in, like, North yeah. Carolina. Yeah, he's trying to do, like, the Free State Project 2.0 or something. And, uh, I mean, it, it sounds like he always, he was, like, even when he was writing the, two, the, uh, of the sponta a spontaneous order like he held like these um like all right beliefs it seems like a very long time yeah i mean i there was also that i don't know if it's true or not but there is the whole rumor about how he thinks he's like from an alien race or something i don't know if that's i mean i heard it from like people who were actually being serious about it and actually like heard it from reasonable people but i mean yeah it seems like there's something off about that guy i haven't heard from him in a while though he thinks he's yeah. her off or something. Yeah. yeah and if he impregnates like a woman, the babies will be magical or something. There was something to that too, which then ties yeah. him right back to Molyneux because they must both have obsessions with eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing about Rachel's is he's just an insufferable twit. I've dealt with him enough online where again talk about not being able to make any sort of an argument whatsoever he just talks in circles moves the goalposts uh is gay but doesn't want to be gay so he then hates all gays it's he's a mess of a human being if there's somebody that we should start a gofundme to and send to therapy it's giraffe neck himself <laughs> do you guys remember that time where uh he was talking like because yeah he's he's bisexual which obviously i who cares like i don't i have no yeah. issue with any of that exactly. um but someone posted a comment to him like like because he was complaining about gays and someone posted a comment to him like you can't unsuck a dick and then chase wrote writes actually you can 
That, I remember that was going around for a while. <laughs> yeah, somebody over in the chat here had made that comment, and they said, "Is that the guy that can't unsuck a co um, a caucus?" <laughs> okay. Oh damn. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah, Chase, there's just a whole lot of that ilk out there. And they really exposed themselves all around the same time. And I think you really saw this divide come within libertarianism because of that. And we're still dealing with that outfall today. Uh, that's kind of why we're having this conversation, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. So what, what do you guys think is the way to move um, the libertarian movement forward? Do, do you agree with me that we're kind of like in the doldrums right now? I do think we're kind of, it, it kind of could go, I, I don't know what the future holds right now, honestly. I mean, I feel like there's just a lot of fighting, but I mean, I think some of the fighting's good. Like, I don't think you want people like Chase Rachel's taking over, or people like Molyneux taking over, but it, it doesn't seem like there's, like a path, a clear path to victory right now. I do think there needs to be some kind of excitement in there. Okay. Um. All right. I'm doing some uh, like oh, behind the scenes stuff because here I'll just, I'll just say this to people. We're also messaging each other because I'm, I'm screwing up the camera angles. I'm doing a, a screen share and then I'm forgetting to pull my screen share back off. I may or not be a little bit intoxicated. I'm not going to go there right now, but the fact of the matter is we're all gathered here together. We're all having this great discussion and all of these lovely, lovely people, except for a few out there, are having a great time watching it. For those who have anything negative to say, that's what I say to them. Oh, by the way, my thumb is painted black, so all you motherfuckers over in the group and so on, you can go ahead and call me the androgynous cowboy all day long. I will drink your fucking tears, and then you can jerk off to my picks for 50 bucks on PayPal. <laughs> that about sums it up. You should, you should get her OnlyFans. You know. <laughs> I tried! I honestly did! But I wasn't going to, I just, I like the idea of it being kind of a private blog sort of site. And I follow a lot of people over there, of course, because by God, do I love e-girls, but oh. especially, especially the emo type, not emo hop being, <laughs> but, but I, I was going to start one and just kind of blog over there just for my own, my own self and a couple of the friends that I've made over on OnlyFans. And they denied my ID and I've been too lazy to try to resubmit it. So as of right now, if you want a picture of my dick, just send me a PM and I'll send it to you for a buck 50. How's that? Com this conversation 50. really took a turn. Yeah. It did. It, it did. Well, there was... I'll do it for a dollar 25. See, see, now I've underbid you. Free market. Hey, now. I was going to say, this is the market working. Let, <laughs> you know what? Let's not go back to the gold standard. Let's go to the dick pic standard. <laughs> That's something I can get behind. And I think most of our society can, even if they won't admit it outright publicly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be dicks. We can use boobs, too. Like, I mean, it depends upon cultural preferences. <laughs> Which we're not allowed to talk about. Yeah, can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you what what do you guys think i mean we're, we're just kind of sitting here this again is our very first broadcast we didn't really plan out the ending portion do we want to hang out a little while longer continue this conversation john my mighty captain i salute you what would you like to do with this voyage if there's anything we'd like to talk about i'm down to talk about it that's good. I, I, I like our relaxed atmosphere here. We're not <laughs> trying to be like all fancy and shit and like, you know, John's got his little t-shirt if he wants. Oh to yeah. Yeah. Gotta, put something up on the, yeah. There it is. Yeah. Look at that. Look at those pecs. Okay. And I want to, I want to show this. Okay. It says, wearing... I was looking at the shirt, but. <laughs> oh, I was working. I was looking at the pecs. It's a rock Maybe... owl shirt. It says, it says, see you in the pit motherfucker. <laughs> oh, I love that. Uh, maybe we can go to the pec standard. <laughs> Oh. Anyway, I've got I've got my Wayland shirt. I'm certainly not buff like you, John, but I ain't got no goddamn sleeves. It's over <laughs> 70 today. Sleeves are worthless. Fuck <laughs> that. <laughs>
I got so much shit for the for having no sleeves on the Dave Smith show. That was like oh, half the comments. You're gay. You don't have <laughs> sleeves. You're gay. That's the other thing. Okay, with that with that ilk. All right, that ilk over there. They bugged me because of that. Like I was alluding to a moment ago. That's what they've got. A guy doesn't have sleeves on, so suddenly he's gay. I'm sorry if the person and, and this is okay. I, I, this What's is an editorial. Be the problem with that too. <laughs> this is an. What's that, Drew? I'm sorry. I'm saying, what would be the problem if he was gay? Like, exactly. What What if it is a gay guy wearing no <laughs> sleeves? Who gives a shit? But and that's the problem I I, I see with, and I and let me let me try to formulate this correctly in my brain right now. But the fact of the matter is, when you're running around calling someone gay as an insult because they don't have sleeves, that probably tells me all I need to know about you as a person and that sort of person if that's their attitude and their outlook on life that's most likely going to bleed over to their politics and i think we see so much of that that personal preference bleeding over to the politics which then makes them suspect as far as i'm concerned of being an actual libertarian Yeah, <laughs> Jeremy, comment on you that. It. You nailed it. I mean, I you know the whole. I mean, not not talking about cultural or um, you know, not talking about culture or anything like that is. It's kind of making it a no no. Doesn't open up any minds. Doesn't yeah. teach anybody anything. Um, you know, and that's how you know I learn about different people and um, and you know, have, have taken on new, new ideas. Most of my new ideas are not my new ideas, but most of the ideas, you know, that I've developed over the, the last few years have come from talking about culture, talking about, um, you know, different people's struggles, learning, you know, history, um, and just sweeping that under the rug denies everybody so much education, yep. uh, to, to really learn and expand more. I mean, you can, talk till you're blue in the face about economics but yeah it gets you know boring after a while and the, the arguments just you know are, are, are circular and, and so definitely talking about cultural things cultural issues is really i think much more mind opening than you know talking about the gold standard yeah i, I agree with that Maybe the gold standard, but I'm a big fan of economics, so it's not. It's not <laughs> I, I am a fan of economics as well. I love, you know, I like talking about economics, but mm -hmm. you 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 don't you don't really get anywhere with with it outside of you know economics. And when you talk about you know cultural things, you you learn a lot more. Um, you you just much more expansive um, in your in your worldview. Not that talking about economics is bad. <laughs> no, I, I know exactly what you're saying because I've had this thought numerous times. Economics are very important, of course. We all know that. And I would consider myself very Austrian-leaning, if nothing else, as far as my economics go. But when economics are the only focus, it's easy to do. And I see this with a lot of people. It's easy to lose the actual sight of humanity human beings, mm -hmm. and ultimately individuals, which I thought was really the heart of everything about libertarianism is the individual. And when you lose the individual, economics really don't have anything else to do. They're just a concept without taking humanity into the entire equation on an individual basis, if that makes sense. Right. Um. The way I I look at it is that I th I think economics is probably like one of like the very most important things when talking about sure. libertarian when talking about libertarianism. Um, I it I wish I, I feel like we're giving not a purposefully but sort of implying that the Mises Caucus talks about economics all the time. They mostly talk about like natural law. Okay, then they won't talk about like justifications for natural law to say. Oh, this is this is wrong. This violates the nap. Okay, it's wrong for this reason. Okay, like stuff like that. That's what I've seen. Um, but if they if they went back to 
the original like like Mises was a utilitarian. Mises, Ludwig von Mises was um, he didn't believe in natural rights. Um, so if if we went back to just talking about economics, I'd be pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's the quote of the show right there. If we just went back to economics, I'd be pretty happy. Drew, you said it best. Well, this has just been a fantastic journey tonight. Drew, thank you so much for coming on board with us. We really appreciate your insight. And it's, you know, and this is another good thing. We can sit around in Facebook groups all day long, whether it be Bakertarians or whatever it might be. But when you really see the people behind those profile pics, it becomes different. And I think engagement like this is oh so important, whatever side of the aisle you might be mixed in. And really welcome you to the show today for bringing us that conversation, Drew. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, my pleasure. Hope to do it uh, again sometime in the future. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Right. An ending song or something? There it is. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Fakertarians podcast. We promise in the future we'll be on time. We promise in the future we'll have a few more things planned. What am I saying? We don't promise you shit. <laughs> have a good night, all you motherfuckers. <laughs> good night, everyone.